How can we build resilience in our bodies and the world around us? Of many options, cold therapy is one. Welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics, powered by the health section of American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Resilience both in engineering and human psychology, is the ability to withstand, recover from, and adapt to changes, whether they come from the natural disasters, personal stress, or systemic pressures. It's about more than just bouncing back. It's about evolving, strengthening through adversity. Our guest today will help us today navigate and make us understand the above adjustments. Dr. Thomas Seeger, PhD, an associate professor at the Arizona State University, is the forefront of studying resilience in both infrastructure and human systems. He's the founder of Self Actual Engineering, a concept that explores the intersection of engineering, ethics, personal growth. He's also the co-founder of the Morosco Forge a company that promotes cold plunge therapy. Dr. Seeger merges physical and psychological resilience, helps people improve their mental and physical health through cold immersion. His research spans a variety of fields, from circular economies, sustainable to ethics in engineering, showing how resilience can be cultivated in individual and communities. Dr. Siegel's innovative approach have shaped thinking about resilience at a collective and personal level. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Dr. Thomas Siegel. Dr. Siegel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Dr. Siegel, let's emerge right into it. Tell us a little bit about your work connecting resilience in engineering with resilience in people. Well, What's know, the biggest lesson not, from engineering that we can apply in our lives? My doctorate, this goes back to 2001. Uh, I earned my doctorate in civil engineering and my emphasis was on the environment because when I was a boy, I grew up in Pittsburgh. There were these issues of air pollution and water pollution and they were a salient part of my childhood. But by the time I finished my doctorate, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act had really done their job mostly in the United States, we can now take clean water, clean air, clean soil for granted. We're more worried about pesticides in our food and we sort of have the luxury of worrying about microplastics, whereas the generation Mm -hmm. before us was choking on smog. So my career has evolved from pollution to sustainability to resilience. Sustainability envelopes the social, the environmental and the economic And we find that these are at risk in natural disasters or in armed conflict or um, in social or economic disruptions like the great financial crisis of 2008. So the question is, for a civil engineer, how do we adapt to change? And so I've started studying infrastructure systems, dams and highways and traffic networks. What I discovered is it's not in the concrete or the steel, Amir. It's in the people. It's in the creative Hmm. response of the people. It's in the new ideas. It's in their openness to information. So I got very curious about the psychology of resilience rather than the technology of resilience. And then COVID happened, locked us out of our classrooms, social distancing, all of these. I was a very vocal critic of these lockdown policies because I didn't think they would help and I thought they would be very damaging. And I got more interested in mental health than I've ever been in physiological health. In particular, we've discovered that mental health relies upon the metabolism. If your brain doesn't have the energy, the power that it needs from its mitochondria, then all the hard work of cognitively reframing a difficult situation or adapting to stress or coping with anxieties becomes all that much more difficult. One of the best ways to boost your metabolism is cold plunge therapy. Because when you get into the cold water, it activates these thermoregulatory mechanisms, vasoconstriction that moves the blood into your core, shivering if you're not already Mm. cold acclimated. And most important of all, it will activate and recruit new brown fat. There is nothing that stimulates mitobiogenesis, so the production of new mitochondria, better than cold plunge therapy. 
so there are several documented cases of people who have responded for, to cold plunge therapy and lifted them out of depression, lifted them out of an acute anxiety when the drugs mm -hmm. didn't work, uh, talk therapy didn't work, when other treatments failed. Now I'm looking at cold plunge therapy for the physiological and the psychological benefits because I no longer concern myself with those things at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, the, the shelter, the food, where civil engineers typically work. I'm now working at the top of Maslow's hierarchy, where sense of belonging and sense of self-esteem and self-actualization reside. This is why I call it self-actual engineering, because I'm getting away from the infrastructure and I'm much more concerned about the people that infrastructure is supposed to be supporting. Excellent. So you just mentioned the word self actual engineering. I know it sounds like a superhero or something supernatural. What's it about? Tell us the everyday folks or people around us how to use it and how can they make their lives consequently more fulfilled by this? This term self-actualization is credited to a famous American psychologist, Abraham Maslow. He published a paper during World War II and it was about human motivation. About this, he was very interested because he did his graduate work at uh, University of Wisconsin. And for a little while, he worked for Harry Harlow. And Harlow was, he didn't know whether the attachment that infants feel to their mother is all about operant conditioning. Is it because they get rewarded with food? Or is there some deeper emotional connection? The experiments that he did with Reese's monkeys demonstrated that there was a deeper emotional connection. And Maslow was very curious about this. So while World War II was raging and Viktor Frankl was wasting away in the Nazi concentration camps, Maslow proposed that there is a hierarchy of human motivation. At the bottom, food, shelter, the basic well-being needs. And it, originally, when he postulated this theory, he said those needs must be met first before sense of self-esteem, sense mm -hmm. of autonomy, sense of mm -hmm. mastery, that build on that sense of belonging. These higher needs could be met. At the very top, Maslow called it self-actualization. And ironically, the army in the 1970s hooked into Maslow and they created this campaign, this recruiting campaign saying, be all that you can be, which was sort of a concise tagline that encapsulated Maslow's idea of self-actualization, realizing our fullest human potential. But a funny thing happened. When Viktor Frankl was liberated from the concentration camps, the death camps, he published the book that was taken from him when he was incarcerated. And this book became Man's Search for Meaning. His experiences under conditions of utter depravity showed that it is not the food and the shelter and the things at the bottom that people really thrive on. It is that these things, can they work in any order? And Frankl said, man can suffer almost any depravity when he has a reason <laughs> why. And this rearranged Maslow's hierarchy. Instead of coming in a certain order, we realized that meaning making, how do we give our experiences a meaning is more important sometimes than any of the other needs. So I ran with that because getting into an ice bath is one of the most miserable, painful things that anybody can do. I mean, why would you on purpose cover yourself up to your neck in freezing cold water? Right. And the answer is because you're trying to become a better person. You're either working on your metabolism or you're working on your psychology because you have the fortitude to do the difficult things I was in this morning. I go in every morning. It's 34 degrees Fahrenheit, so one degree Celsius, essentially. I'm covered up in ice. And I mean, nothing bad can happen to me because once I've had the courage to enter the freezing water and I come out and I feel like Superman, I have so much more confidence to go through my day. So this is part of what I mean by the psychological resilience. Doing, I think Eleanor Roosevelt said, do one thing every day that scares you. And my thing is sitting on my balcony and it measures 34 degrees. 
Wow. So you're obviously big in cold plunge therapy. We see athletes doing that a lot. It's a part of recovery mechanism. Tell us about a couple of things. One, how cold is cold? What's the temperature? What you're looking for? And two, what's the craziest reactions you've seen people when they're taking a plunge for the first time? Well, there are two popular misconceptions about cold plunge therapy that are beginning to change. The first one is that you should do the cold after your exercise to help you recover uh, from late onset muscle soreness or joint pain. And it will do those things. But the difficulty with that is that it will suppress testosterone and it will mm. blunt hypertrophy. So if you're you know, working out because you want bigger muscles, and it doesn't necessarily have to be bodybuilding, but if you, if you want those anabolic effects of exercise and then you cold plunge, you will diminish the anabolic effects, the hypertrophy, the growing of the muscles and the increased strength. And men especially, will get a temporary reduction in their testosterone, which is exactly the hormone that you want to encourage from training. So the first misconception is that you do your ice bath after. Don't do it. Do it before. When you do the ice bath before, men get a boost in testosterone. They still speed their exercise recovery, and you will feel so much more energy during your workout. This is coming mostly out of Craig Heller's lab at Stanford. He did what's called per cooling, and that is extracting heat from the hands in between exercise sets. And he got multiples, and by multiples, I mean three or four times more of the reps out of his athletes than they could do without the per cooling. What I do is pre-cooling, go into the ice bath first, extract the heat, and then do the workout. I've measured my testosterone. I'm typically over a thousand nanograms per deciliter. And when you think that I'm a 58 year old fat college professor, being at a thousand nanograms per deciliter is pretty dang good. There are a lot of guys out there in the two or three hundreds that are going on TRT because testosterone also impacts your mood. When your testosterone is low, your mood is low. You don't feel like you can compete. You don't have any energy. And TRT restores body composition. It ex restores that energy and it restores that will to strive. However, I have a number of case studies well documented with the lab reports that show how testosterone is boosted by doing your cold plunge before your exercise. And there's good mechanisms for it. The mitochondria produce the steroidal precursors to pre testosterone. If your mitochondria aren't right, then your body's not able to produce the testosterone you need. So the first misconception is that, you know, like your, I don't know, high school coach told you you should do it after. No, do your cold plunge before your exercise. The second misconception is a bit more subtle. There was a time maybe when you were in medical school that the medical doctors felt there was no such thing as brown fat in adult human beings. Infants have it, children have it, but we thought, well, it just disappears. You know, adults, they grow out of it. And it turns out that's not the case. 2007, there was a group of Swedish researchers that were looking at PET scans. The PET scans are used to identify, help map tumors in the body. And they found these dark right. spots that weren't tumors. They were symmetrical in the body around the base of the neck and around the heart. And they said, well, we think that's brown fat. They published this paper and everybody sort of laughed at them and said, ah, adults don't have any brown fat. But then someone at the Sloan Kettering Institute in New York went through something like 10,000 PET scans and they found about 5%, so 95% of adults over 45, no detectable brown fat. But about 5% of these scans had brown fat. Now we know that brown fat is this essential secretory organ. It's not just for thermogenesis, mm -hmm. but it produces neuroprotective factors. It elevates the brain-derived neuroprotective factor and the FGF21 that help protect against dementia. It improves insulin sensitivity. It turns out that the adults without brown fat are missing something that their body actually needs. So when you don't get enough cold, and your body loses all the brown fat, you're actually right. losing something essential to the, your thyroid function, to your metabolism, and to your brain. And the good news is it can be restored. It only takes about 50 degrees to activate your metabolism. Uh, if you get into 50 degree water and you feel that gas reflex, <gasps> then you know you're doing a good job. And it looks like that's about the top temperature 
for recruiting new brown fat. If you're doing your cold plunge in the 40s, you're doing fine. But once you become acclimated, you won't shiver anymore. Your brown fat will do the job of thermogenesis, your body will improve its thermoregulatory mechanisms, and you might have to be in there five, six, seven minutes before you begin getting cold. Because for me, anything more than 39, it's just boring. The psychological benefits, they kick in when you get down into the mid to low 30s. Those are the temperatures that frighten you, Amir. And yeah. those are the things you know that that I'm going to suggest make me a stronger person. Right. So you dipped someone in 30 degrees. What's the reaction you've seen because you're part of some projects as well? Tell us something the, you remember interesting. The worst part of the ice bath is the 15 seconds before you get in the ice bath. Right. There is a phrase that Viktor Frankl coined called anticipatory anxiety. Because when you stare down at the ice bath and you see right the chunks of ice floating in there, you are already beginning the thermoregulatory process. You're, You're um, right. Not that your thermal receptors are activating your hypothalamus, but your hypothalamus is already becoming active. And the cells in your body, your brown fat and your, uh, your vein, the smooth muscle tissue that control the circulation in your vein, they don't know the difference between you know, right. the environment and a signal they get from the hypothalamus. So you're already starting this process of activating your sympathetic nervous system. Right. And then you get in. Now, I have seen people do 11 second ice baths where they jump right out. You think that, you know, a firecracker had gone off underneath their ass or something, how fast they get out. Yeah. And then they're typically laughing and smiling about it because there's right. so many things happening in their nervous system all at once. And that nervous energy needs a place to go. But the people who are most experienced, they will get in and in the first 15 seconds, they will feel that gas reflex. They will take control of their breathing. A box breathing is a good idea, but really any structured breathing technique. So that right. instead of <clears throat> and feeling some hyperventilation, you slow all that breathing down. Right. We've measured the brain waves. The brain waves go into an involuntary meditative state when you're able to control your breathing in the freezing cold water. They report a sense after the first or 20, 30 seconds, a sense of peace. And part of this is because so many things are happening in their neurochemistry. The dopamine is up, the noradrenaline is up. And you might think, well, these, these are associated with excitement and they are, but they're not the only neurochemicals that are elevated when you're in the ice bath. Also oxytocin, also vasopressin. So a number of things are adapting in your body to the cold. And the mammalian dive reflex is the most important one. The heart rate slows down. It begins to conserve the oxygen in your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Because every mammal, as you know, is gestated, you know, in the womb. Human beings in particular are designed to be born in the water. The, the newborn knows not to breathe when its face is wet. And so every mammal has the same reflex that shuts down the breathing mechanisms called the dive reflex when its face is wet. And it will wait until, if it can, it resurfaces to gasp for air again. We are amazing creatures, Amir. I, that's an amazing association. It was never think about how mammals, you made that association, how we are born in water, and then we take that first gasp. And that's what exactly what you're doing when you're doing those coast plunges. So thanks for that. That's that association is just absolutely marvelous. I just want to go back to your initial comments about the testosterone. How do you you pre pack and then do a cold plunge afterwards? an elevation and then a submersion again of the testosterone. Do we apply that for women as well? And is and especially I'm talking about those athletes who like to do cold plunges as well. Any any effects in your mind about that? And is there any research that are out there? Women and men are very different when it comes to testosterone. But mm -hmm. uh, there's one thing that they have in common. Testosterone is the most important sex hormone in both women and men. There is exactly. more testosterone in a healthy woman than there is estrogen. 
And this, absolutely. This, you know, blows the, the women's minds because we think of estrogen or all the estrogens as the female sex hormone, and it is. But women rely upon testosterone, even though they have about one tenth of the levels a man does. So testosterone management is very important for women. It comes from four places in a woman's body. The ovaries are very important, but they're only about one quarter of the total testosterone that a woman will produce. The adrenal glands are responsible for as much or more as the ovaries. And then you have skin cells and fat cells as these other secondary sources. Amir, nothing will stimulate the adrenal glands, the skin cells, and the fat cells better than a cold plunge. So Absolutely. When a woman, Brilliant. You know. And so she gets an immediate reaction of increased anti activity in her adrenals and her fat and her skin cells that produces testosterone. There's really only been one study. And unfortunately, it's salivary testosterone, which is less reliable than blood serum, but it shows a significant spike just from cold stimulation. This is just putting the dominant hand in one bowl of ice water. Women get a bigger relative boost from cold stim than men ever could. Because in men, those super high testosterone levels, they're produced in the testes. And if you do the cold after the exercise, for reasons that are still mysterious, testosterone comes down. I suspect that it's because you can overload the mitochondria. The mitochondria are already exerting themselves, producing the ATP necessary to fuel the exercise. Then you get into the cold plunge, the, uh, the glucose stores in the muscles are already depleted by the exercise. Uh, you start the thermal regulation, and it's possible that the test, there's not much left for testosterone production. Because remember, it is those mitochondria that produce the steroidal precursors. They take cholesterol, and they synthesize the steroids that become testosterone. Sure. If your mitochondria are already overworked, it's not going to happen. So you sure. can say... Why does it work well the other way when you pre-cool and then do exercise? And it is because the mitochondria are fatigued by overheating of the muscles. When you pre-cool, the muscles don't get to the same level of fatigue. They don't generate the same sort of overheating reaction. It means that the production of reactive oxygen species around the mitochondria is not as great. And this is this is hypothetical. I should caution you that these studies are badly needed to explain why the order of things is so important. And all I have is this hypothesis about the essential role of mitochondria. Thanks for explaining that because, and obviously the clarification, because we do, our audience do want to know what's the scientific backing behind it, but a lot of it makes sense. And one of the points that you reiterated, and I want to reinforce is it's not just men who have testosterone. And it's not just women who have estrogen. And that's where the beauty is. And there's a we've had a separate program on that. It's a combination. So we really appreciate that clarification, uh, Dr. Seeger. Let's move on to another topic related to the cold plunges and your work in it. One of them is aesthetics. And we, we want to know your opinion about, does it help the skin? Does it make it look more refreshed? We know we've just discussed the role in athletes, but how about that aspect of it? And how do you tie that with your current work or, or any research that's out there? I've always had sensitive skin. I'm not the best subject. <laughs> you know, I wish I could tell you, oh, my skin is so beautiful. And it's not. I'm not even the paragon of health, Amir. I'm about the worst spokesperson. I should be, you know, a ripped muscle bound Instagram influencer and said, hey, you know, buy an ice bath and look like me. But I, that's not the way it works. I live this, you know, scholastic life. I should exercise more. I should do a lot of things right. My experience of the skin is that when I added Epsom salt to my ice bath, it gives me a good soft feeling on my skin. I just enjoy that feeling, but I can't tell the ladies out there that it's going to, you know, eliminate their wrinkles or it's going to make them look younger. There are claims that would probably help me sell more ice baths that I just can't back up with the studies that I'm looking up in the library. Thank you. One of the most important ones is weight loss. It mm -hmm. is true. When you get into the ice bath, you will burn fat. There are continuous ketone monitors that are 
I'm going to measure this for you. And it's almost instantaneous. The fastest way to get into ketosis, or at least to stimulate your own endogenous ketone production, is to get into an ice bath. But what they don't tell you on the ads for ice bath equipment is that compensatory metabolic mechanisms will restore the white fat cells at night. Your core body temperature will be a little lower at night. And your body will attempt in this homeostatic way to rebuild the fat stores that you lost when you were in the ice bath burning it all up. And there's some good animal model studies with rats about how this works. Nobody, you know, I'm probably the best example of how you can do 2000 ice baths and still be 28% body fat because I just had mine measured and frankly, Amir, I'm obese. But the testosterone levels that I maintain keep my face, keep, you know, my bone structure is pretty good and the, the face looks leaner than it otherwise would. It is very rare to have the combination of 28% body fat and high insulin sensitivity. I just came from the Optispan labs in Seattle where they did this comprehensive test, including a DEXA scan. And the physician there, George Haddard, he said, I don't understand your results. You know, when we scan everything with the ultrasound, we see no signs of arterial plaque. When I look for fatty liver, I see your liver is in great shape. When I measure your lipids, you've got a triglyceride to HDL ratio that is under one, which is almost unheard of in someone with your body composition. I can only credit this to the ice baths because it is possible to be metabolically healthy, even if, um, if I got too much subcutaneous fat around sure, my sure, waist. Sure. It is the visceral fat inside the body, around the organs, crowding the organs that is most unhealthy, that is associated with increased mortality. What the, the cold plunge does for you is remodel the fat in your body. It will reduce liver fat, reduce visceral fat, but it's no miracle for weight loss. I'm sorry about that, ladies. Absolutely. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Tell us your work about, you've co-founded the Morosco Forge, and that is something that promotes ice spots for resilience. Tell us how is your association with that and what's uh, the science behind it? Anything you would like to put out for us? I had a former student who invited me to do ice baths. I was doing cold showers because I read a book, you know, was going to toughen me up and I hate cold showers. It turns out there's a study in Finland comparing partial cold water immersion with whole body cold water immersion. In partial cold water, you don't get the dive reflex. You know, it might be on your shoulders or on your arm or something, but your body knows you're not going into the water. And so you don't get those meditative benefits. Well, he invited me to do an ice bath. He said, you ever heard of Wim Hof? I never heard any of this stuff. This is like back in 2018. I got in the ice bath and it was magnificent. So we thought, hey, this is a lot of fun. You know, we're going to keep this up as a hobby. But I also got a blood test back, Amir. And at this time, I was 51 or 52. And my prostate-specific antigen came back mm -hmm. 7. Now, 7 is not a death sentence. But, you know, the advice is, okay, have a prostate exam. And then you find the doctor who's going to be super conservative. Say, we're going to do a biopsy. We're going to pick out 16 samples of tissue out of your prostate. And we're going to test those. And unfortunately, the false positive rate on a prostate biopsy is pretty high. So by the time I got done reading WebMD, I thought I was going to die. You know, I thought I had prostate cancer because, we, it, you know, we do our own research, but we, our catastrophic mind creates these anxieties. I said, I am not going to go to the medical doctor and start the cascade of allopathic interventions and all the sequela or the side effects that could result mm -hmm. from that. I talked to these guys, they'd had prostatectomies and they'd had biopsies and it sounded terrible. So I said, what I'm going to do instead is a ketogenic diet. And I got really serious about ice baths then every day, three, four minutes. And I would come out, I would do some exercise. It took about four months to get my PSA down to 1.8. And I got it even lower. And that's how I discovered, with sort of accident, the boost in the testosterone. The luteinizing hormone, by the way, also went up. Because by the time I got to my urologist, I thought I was in the clear. I'm like, look at my PSA, doc, you know, I'm good, right? And he didn't care about my PSA. He wanted to measure my luteinizing hormone because he didn't believe my testosterone. I was 1180. 
at that time. And, you know, he and I are the same age. And he's like, there's no way this fat 50 year old guy, you know, has that luteinizing hormone 8.9 also off the charts. When I discovered that, I wrote an article about it because I'm a scientist. Sure enough, there's a study from 1991 in Japan. The order of things is really important when you're doing um, the pre-cooling. Nobody read that article except Joe Rogan because Joe Rogan was really concerned about testosterone. Liver King, who's this incredibly, you know, he's a funny sort of internet celebrity. He had just been revealed as being on steroids, as if you didn't know. And so Rogan was saying, you know, I'm reading about testosterone and I found this guy, Rogan has Morosco, and he put my picture up on his show and he read about my experience to David Goggins. And that's when the article, you know, 10,000 views, 20,000 views, 30,000 views. By that time, I had published dozens of articles on the essential role of cold in a hormetic approach to health. People began to discover them. Sometimes I get accused, you know, on Twitter of making up the facts about ice baths so I can sell more ice baths. And those people get the order of operations wrong. I'm not fabricating the science to try and sell the ice bath. I fabricated the ice bath because there was nothing like it in the marketplace. Sure. And once you realize what the health and the psychological benefits are, you have to share this with the world. You have to make something available to people like Joe so that they can get these health benefits too. So I wrote a book, you know, I summarized all the it's not even on Amazon, Amir. You can only get it on MorozcoForge.com. It's called Uncommon Cold. And I've, I'm a little self-conscious as a scholar. We're going through a second edition. I will do that on Kindle Direct Publishing so that people can buy it on Amazon. It's got like 400 scientific citations because I don't know how to do it any other way. It's bigger than my dissertation ever was. So the science is really getting good and it's overturning a lot of the myths and misconceptions that we used to think were true. So let's just sum it up, uh, uh, Dr. Seeger. I would guess that we've discussed a little bit about uh, sustainability. We've discussed a little bit about resilience, engineering. Give us your final thoughts. There are messages that we get from our institutions of public health. There are messages we get from our insurance companies and mm -hmm. often our primary care physicians. I mean, I know you're in the Baylor group of hospitals and so you are up to your eyeballs, right? In institutional healthcare and mm -hmm. no one is responsible for your health but you. This is the most important thing. Your doctor is an advisor. Your health insurance is a tool, not a decider. And too many people are, are sort of taught that either their government or their insurance company or their employer or their physician is in charge of their health. And it's not true because there is only one person that lives inside of your body. And you must, with the benefit of the advice, with the benefit of these additional resources, decide what is the right health condition for you. I don't mm -hmm. care what the peer reviewed literature says. I don't care what the P factor on the epidemiological study says. You don't know whether you belong in the 99 group or the N equals one group until you experiment on your own body. And if it's not working for you, it doesn't matter what the study says. If it is working for you, then keep it up. That's the most important message. Thank you very much, Dr. Seeger.